Hi everybody, this is Cynthia Gibb. Please join us this Sunday at 7 p.m. for Break a Leg. Well, I'll be there. And it's a Fane special. Yes, all things Fane. Please join us. So we're going to explore in this hour of the show the word fame. What does it mean to those who perform on stage, who aspire to be on stage, and those who've made it on stage? We're going to hear from some of the stars, like Lee Carreri, who played Bruno, Valerie Landsberg, who played Doris, uh, Loretta Chandler, who played Dusty, and Cynthia Gibb, who played Holly. Now we're going to hear from Lee Carreri now, who played Bruno. What does fame, and what has fame, meant to him. Fame is what, um, the TV show is what brought me to Los Angeles. Uh, I, I probably felt like, if I, I may have stayed in New York hadn't it been for fame, because in New York I felt like I had everything. You know, it's that sort of, it's like Romans, you know, like they, these, they're, they're in the empire, so they kind of feel like, you know, everything is there and everything they need is culturally there. And I, I think, uh, Coming out to Los Angeles was was also a life changing, just because it kind of opened up all these sort of um, entrees into show business and, and television that I wanted with music. And um, as 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 far back as when I was a little kid, I wanted to be uh, I wanted to be Lalo Schifrin, who wrote music for Mission Impossible and, so, and shows like that. And uh, and I thought that um, I thought it was so cool to uh, to be able to bring a jazzy element into into uh, television and. Um, and then that's what, to some extent, I ended up doing, you know, was writing for TV shows, not quite as jazzy as Lalo Schifrin, but, um, but I, felt, I feel like it really, it, it changed my life in that way, and it kind of brought me closer to uh, stuff that I love doing. You know, of course, things have changed over the years so much, but um, Los Angeles still, um, still seems to be, a, it's still growing and still developing in terms of just uh, its, its own culture and its own art scene, and... and um, and uh, I appreciate fame for you know for having having kind of put me in that setting. It doesn't sound like fame as an entity in itself then was ever a goal of yours, was it? No, no, I I, I don't. I really just wanted to make music, and and uh, I think I think the uh, the fame and the successes kind of drop you in different locations in, in the world that maybe you wouldn't have gone. So so it's for for that to that end i think it, it it helped but no i never really cared about uh being being famous how did you cope with it then when it came i it was a, it was a little a little difficult you know um i i mean I, it, it, that sounds a, like a weird thing coming from someone but but when when um when you're in it you know you realize very quickly that um you know you can't do things that that people normally do because people are, are watching you a little, little bit more closely, mm. you know, and um, you know, uh, you know, it, like I, I remember as a as a twenty year old, I was out in L.A. and I remember someone saying, um, "Oh, you were on that, you're on that show. Yeah, you cut me off the other day on the road, <laughs> you know." So it's 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 like that. It's like uh, all of a sudden people are uh, looking at you under a microscope a little bit more. Now, having said that. I'm, I appreciate having gone through that in the early 80s before there were cell phones and Twitter and the internet and, and so we had a whole lot more freedom back then than we, than we would have now, you know, and so, so I, 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 I thank my lucky stars that, that it all happened back then. Your journey in fame started with the movie mm -hmm. and then went into the TV series and it feels to me that the movie was very, very different in its concept and its delivery than the TV series was. The TV series was gentler, oh, was yes. more family orientated and the music that you were involved in was, was more mainstream, shall we say. I'm not saying the original film wasn't, right. but was that a conscious transition? Because you were one of the few that, that were involved, weren't you? Yeah, well, I, 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 I think I love the grittiness of the film. And obviously, you know, films you can make more, more real. As soon as I got to uh, Culver City, to the MGM lot, to do the TV show, I noticed that things were very different. Um, for num number one, uh, the clothes that we wore uh, were spick and span clean and starched. And... I used to take my wardrobe and sometimes I had, they had this corduroy jacket that they'd throw on me and I would take it and drag it down the street just to make it look like it was worn and weathered and dirty a little bit. And, uh, and you know, this also the, uh, the plot lines and the lines were, 
I, as much I love, love Bill Blinn, who is a, the writer and the executive producer, just this heart and soul of a TV show. But also, you know, it, it obviously didn't have the negative, horrible elements of the, the gritty, realistic elements of the movie. So to me, it was more like a Hallmark uh, greeting card, you know, and... Um, but, you know, it, even within that context, Bill Blinn did a really excellent job of, of, of introducing uh, uh, social issues in the show, you know, as much as you could introduce them in the early 80s, you know. What was your fa- I mean, you obviously wrote quite a bit of the music. Um, what was your favorite song from that show? Oh, gosh. Um, I, I, I really loved uh, the lullaby that I wrote early on in Could We Be Magic Like You. I think, um, you know, I think it just became a song that if anyone had heard it, you know, uh, some people say that they, they still write me and they say that they want the sheet music because they want to play it for a newborn, uh, you know, a newborn baby that is coming to their family or they want to sing it to their newborn or, you know, so that, that fills me with uh, joy. To me, that's what it's all about is that uh, someone else uh, notices and uses your song for something that in real life. You know. You had a, on screen at least, a very close relationship with Valerie who played Doris. Mm-hmm. How was that in real life? Though? In real life, we were roommates in the beginning. Um, we, we met in New York doing the pilot and um, she was already a, a Los Angeles native. So so she was basically like, you know what, come with me, we'll get an apartment and I'll, I'll show you the ropes out in LA. She, because I, I had no idea. So I was living in the East Village in New York and 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 she said, do you know, have any idea where you want to live? And all of a sudden I said, I have no idea, but I like, is there anything like the East Village? She said, Venice Beach is where you, where you want to be. And um, certainly enough, it was it was just like the East Village. It was funky and, and, and Valerie's just there. She's just here. To, and, 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 it's, and so sure enough, here was the East Village with, with the ocean right there. And, uh, and so um, we got a place together on the first floor of this house that was a, a maybe a few doors away from the actual Venice Beach, and uh, and it, it was uh, you know I really I, I haven't strayed far from there in the last, in the in the forty years I've been in Los Angeles. Now I'm in Marina del Rey, which is only about a half a mile from there. So so I uh, it, I, I got stuck there. So that, that on stage on set chemistry was real, then, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. How much are you looking forward to the reunion concert? Then? Oh sure, sure. Well, you know just. Right now, what we're going through, we're doing the rehearsals, but it's so much fun to be with everybody because we, you, we go back to being, you know, kids again, you know. A reminder, that reunion concert is at Birmingham Town Hall, Thursday, Friday and Saturday. Now, one of the big, big stars was Valerie Landsberg, who played Doris. And that song that you just heard, High Fidelity, was a massive hit. She was the lead singer on it, and she was the glue. I always felt she was the glue that held the series together. So what did fame mean to her because i grew up in a family that was entrenched in show business not necessarily from the acting side but from the producing side so i had you know i'd met a lot of people i'd been in those kind of places and and you know my dad had been a very very iconic documentary producer with david walper and so you know i had we had been in big houses we had been you know so so that wasn't as much of like oh we're we're thrust in the spotlight and by that time i'd already toured with paul lynn all over the united states i had been in the movie thank god it's friday you know so i'd been to you know i've been through big stuffs and big openings and things like that so it wasn't really that i think the interesting really experience for me was all of a sudden, you know, because we know that I auditioned for the same role in the movie and didn't get it, and then I got this role. And so now we're in there and, and I think one of the things that was interesting was in the first year, you know, because there was like Erica was like so like off the charts talented, you know, which is in Jean, everything like that. And it was Bill really f- trying to figure out like what was you know what was my pur- purpose in the series and you know because we always laughed and joked and said like i used to just come in and go like uh you know coco has a problem and then i would walk out you know and so but eventually bill really found what she was because she was different than what she was in the movies with maureen Tiffy who played her and um but well, doris was the was the the glue that held everything together. Well, I think she was in, in the series, I think that's really what she became. And and so, you know, it was good. I mean, I, I, it was an amazing, you know, it was an amazing education. Not, not only, 
you know, not only for, um, like I learned, you know, like directors, mm-hmm. writers, you know, I wrote an episode, I directed an episode, uh, you know, all those things. And I think they're just, and, and the, the interesting part is like when I decided to leave, I really decided to leave because it was getting a little wacky. You know, I was uh, almost 27 years old and, you know, kind of being 27 and playing 16 or 17, it's a little weird after a while. I'm married, you know, and uh, so, but I I never expected it to really um, do what it did. You know, I was, I mean, I traveled, I was the first person to come here to do interviews and things like that. And, you know, so I was aware of the amount of stuff that was going on about it and that it was just such a huge hit here. So then, and then, you know, there's kind of a, you know, quiet period right after this, but very short, because really shortly after this, get a call, come to do the morning show, get a call, come to, you know, constantly being coming here. And so that was, you know, so it just kept it alive. Plus the fact that we all, in, in our own kind of versions, we all kept in touch with each other, depending on kind of who we were close, who we were closer to and knew more. But this is this is a family. I mean, you you know when you you hang out with us, if we're all together, it really is like this family, you know. And now, especially now at our age, you know, we just really you know we love each other, we support each other, we've gone through every kind of life change with each other, and. You know, it's pretty remarkable. I interview actors and performers all the time. Most of them are younger and at the relative beginning of their careers. And obviously I speak to some amateur um, people who want and aspire to be famous. From your position of all this experience and, uh, you know, being a little older and having been through it, what advice would you give? Because a lot of people, particularly these days, seem to see fame as an entity in itself. Well, you know, the thing is, when we did the satellite video, I interviewed everybody. And, you know, almost across the board, everybody said, I wouldn't have been so hard on myself. So you have to really be for yourself. You know, recognize your own worth. Yes, you're growing. Yes, you're learning. You know, all those things. But recognize as you learn, as you grow. And because you're what you got, you know, remain open, always be a student of this, always know that you can continue to enhance your craft and improve your craft and open wider, you know, to yourself, you know, and be yourself. That's the best thing you can be. It really is an actor, especially when you're young, be yourself. That's all we want of you. I know that as a director now. It's like when I when I audition somebody who's young, I just want you to be you. I just want you to be you. It isn't as easy as it looks. But Did it you can recommend be. it? Yeah, I recommend it. <laughs> I suppose that the final question is, you know, you have been associated with high fidelity and different songs and whatever from fame. Have you got a favorite song? When we spoke on Zoom um, last year or whenever it was, you talked about the Wizard of Oz episode as being your favorite. What about a favorite song? It's kind of tough. You know, my friend- There were so many good ones that you did. You know, my friend Paul Jabara, who I was in Thank God It's Friday with, who was an amazing songwriter, wrote Beautiful Dreamer. And Beautiful Dreamer is a great song. We're focusing on interviews I did this week in Liverpool at the rehearsals for the Fame reunion taking place in Birmingham this weekend. Uh, 40 years on from, yeah, 40 years ago, 1982 Fame first came out. Uh, 40 years of Fame. Loretta Chandler is next. She played a character called Dusty a little later on in the series, so not as familiar perhaps uh, to many of us who watched it because some of the latest series of Fame never actually made it to uh, mainstream TV. But here's Loretta, who I spoke to this week in Liverpool, telling us what Fame meant to her. It is. It's very exciting, especially since we went through COVID and now we get a chance to be together again. And um, yeah, just seeing my old family, I love it. I absolutely love it. I asked Lee and Valerie when I was chatting to them about Fame 
both the, the, the literal the TV programme, but also how fame affected them and how it affects people. So can I ask you the same question? You can take it in whichever direction you want, but fame, what, what does that word mean to you? Um, it says it in the name. It's fame. It's a chance to be something to the whole world, which I think a lot of us aspire to be. You want to know that you're here for a reason, that you've got a purpose. And if that purpose is to inspire someone to go for their dreams, I can't think of a better purpose than that. I mean, I present a radio show which is all about theatre, so I talk to a lot of actors and actresses about wanting to be the best that they can be. You're an inspiration, aren't you? Because you've, you've achieved it. You can look back. I mean, I'm not saying your career's at an end, but you can look back on everything that you've fulfilled. So what, what's your message to, to people who are at the other end of that, that journey? Uh, go for it. Because if it could happen to someone from Pueblo, Colorado, who was watching this movie, wishing she could be a part of all that magic, and then God said, yes, you can, you got to go for it. you got to just keep trying no matter what. And it may come when you don't expect it. I mean, I was just helping some others go to an audition that I didn't think I would even be considered for. And I ended up here. So never let go of it. Get that training in, that's important to you, and go for it. And obviously I watch a lot of amateur productions as well. And there's a fine line actually between professionalism and... It's basically who you know. And, where, and if you're at the right place at the right time, pretty much. Yeah, because there's a lot of amateurs out there. I would, you know, say a heartbeat, oh, they can blow me away. But I happen to be in the right place at the right time where someone could put me on a higher stage. That's basically all it is. It's, you know, you love your gift, keep building on it, and then see how far God takes you with it. What was the pressure like when you came into the TV series to follow John oh, Jackson? That was huge. <laughs> that was huge. So again, I wasn't sure I was even going to get on the show. I brought a bunch of dancers down here to audition for it. And it turned out they were looking for singers too. And so when I got to the show, there was still this little insecurity in the back of my head saying, I'm not a dancer's size. I'm not sure I should really be here. I was going through different physical things in my body, cyst and sick. And finally someone just said, let it go. You're here now. You're one of us. Just share what God gave you. That released me, and I was able to come be a part of it more. I still get that way a little bit. I think we all still have those insecurities. There's things about us, you know, no one else really sees, but we kind of tend to harp on. So I'm just always trying to get out of my head and just enjoy the moment. And when you do that, it's like magic. You get a chance to just be in all of that loveliness that you've been dreaming about. So, so when you get a chance to get there, and I know some of you will, enjoy it do not let it take you over don't let the fear take you over enjoy your moments because it goes really fast really fast speaking of enjoyment then, which was a song that you sang or maybe even a general song from the show that's your favorite easy to believe if you believe in me then i know i must be worth believing in i love that song and all you need is one person to believe you can do it and then go for it. The other person I spoke to was Cynthia Gibbs. She played a character called Holly. Cynthia's had a fantastic career, even away from fame uh, in Hollywood and, and is a very down-to-earth uh, lady who I had the pleasure of meeting. And here she talks to me about fame from her perspective, which is particularly insightful. She became really quite philosophical and then her favourite song from the show. Obviously, the word fame, the word, not the name, has a lot of power. Um, and people use their fame for different reasons. Some people use it for manipulation and some people use it for their ego. And some people use it to do good deeds. Um, when I joined the cast of fame, I was only 19. I certainly didn't feel famous um, and nor did I ever think the show would be as um, as popular as it was um, or that we would all still be here 40 years from now and um, I'd like to think that I've used you know whatever platform I have for the greater good over the years. And how has fame affected you? I mean uh, I know Val has some very um, well-known sort of ups and downs in her life. Has it always been a constant course for you? 
Oh, sure. There are always ups and downs. I, I always say that, that, you know, if we're lucky enough to live long enough, you know, all of us experience um, pain and, and loss and things that humble us. Um, and certainly if you stick around in Hollywood long enough, there are very high highs and there are very low lows. The way I've survived the lows is by surrounding myself with people who love me, truly love me, not people who are just, you know, sick of ants or, you know, people who are, we say, blowing smoke up your butt, right? Um, but, you know, people, real friends, people who know who I really am and love me in spite of it, and um, who have my back during the times that um, are difficult. So it sounds like there are obviously ups and downs to all this process, mm -hmm. and there will be younger people who, and I see it in real life all the time, who now aspire to fame as an entity in mm -hmm. itself. What do you say to those people then? Um, I, I agree with you, and I think um, a lot of young people are, are using, um, for example, the Kardashians as an example of just like fame for the sake of fame. And, um, and I don't think that's sustainable. You know, if you want fame, if you want to be fame, which is the version of a, a recognition of being something or doing something significant, you have to back it up with talent or deeds, good deeds, or something that gives back to society. Um, you know, this fame for the sake of, you know, having a lot of followers, I think is a very empty thing to chase. I don't, I don't see that it's gonna keep you warm at night or, you know, or help you get through the real challenges in life because your followers don't really love you. I mean, they're not, it's not like family or best friends who, who, as I said before, love you in spite of, you know, your your attributes and your faults and you know all the all the other parts. Um, yeah, I, I I suppose there's always been that kind of um, superficial, quick, you know, fame, but but it doesn't get sustained unless you've got something to to back it up. So now you're at this stage of your life and you've achieved everything, when you look back at what happened to you in the TV series, do you remember it really fondly and do you, do you, do you constantly look back like that? Because you seem quite a philosophical person actually. <laughs> well, let's just get something straight. I haven't achieved everything yet, but, um, but I am content with my career. I, I'm, I, I've had a really wonderful ride for over 40 years um, working professionally. And um, if I never get another opportunity to work in the industry, I, I'm fine with that. I, I derive s most of my joy these days from being with my, my family, um, my husband and my dogs and my kids. And I have a new granddaughter in my life. and. Um, and I have a school, I have actually a, a performing arts school and, and I work with probably about a hundred students um, on a regular basis in classes and private lessons. And um, I actually am really fulfilled helping to um, allow other people to you know, achieve their dreams and reach their potential. It gives me a, an enormous amount of satisfaction to just facilitate other people's success. When I look back on the TV series Fame that you were so much a part of, I see so many ethical stories, which is quite true to what you've been talking about, about aspiration and mm. loss and all the different subjects that were carried out. I don't see TV series about stage and about musical theatre mm. and about all those things that have those ingredients. And in fact, there probably aren't that many TV series like that anymore. Do you re regret that? Because that, it was great storytelling, it was great songs, it was great entertainment, but at its core, it had a real eth ethical stance to it. And I miss that. Um, I, I think you're correct. I, over the years, I've been very aware of how many times they've tried to recreate what was special about the series. And nobody's come close. I think Glee is the closest that has come in terms of the success, but it was a much much light heart, more light-hearted storytelling. They had great music, 
great performers, wonderful singers, and, and I think the music producers were excellent on that show. Um, but they didn't have the, the same kind of storytelling, and um, I can't take credit for that at all. We, as cast members, were all very um, fortunate, more than fortunate, to work under Bill Blinn, who is our writer-producer. He's the one that brought just this very, very real storytelling. There was humor, there was sadness, there was conflict. Things didn't get tied up in a neat little bow at the end of the episode, you know. We we didn't all get along, our characters didn't all get along perfectly, right? It, it, it was a real, and, and look at the ethnic diversity on the show. We were, you know, way ahead of our time in that way. Um, and so I, I think Bill really painted this very three-dimensional picture of life in New York as an artist. What's your, and just to finish off with, what's, what's your, I mean, it can be one that you sang, it can be one that somebody else sang, but what's your favorite song from the show? Um, I always loved Erica's song, I Still Believe in Me. That one moved me the first time I heard it. I, I was mesmerized by it, and I, I love the way Erica performs it. Um, but the lyrics still mean something to me. You know, it's it, you definitely, as an artist, a professional artist, you have to have an inner belief in your abilities, um, you know, to succeed, because without that, all the rejection, and the rejection is, is the majority of what you're going to face. You're going to get rejected 90-something percent of the time you show up for an audition. And that's normal. Like, that's being a professional. Um, so I think um, having that belief in yourself is what sustains you through um, all those disappointments. Cynthia Gibb concluding our special tribute to the kids from Fame.